Well, welcome to my office on this Wednesday afternoon. Uh, it's a busy Wednesday afternoon here at Redland, and I know many of you may be planning to watch this, then come, and others are, can't come, but let me just share with you a little bit about church life. Uh, you know, we're trying to start back Wednesday nights after we took off January because of the COVID uh, increase, and so tonight will be the first Wednesday night in almost a year. Uh, really for 11 months, it's at least 11 months that we've had a uh, teaching for every age group. So tonight at 6 o'clock, 5.30, we have what they call snack supper. It's not We're not cooking a meal. We're just having finger food and some pizza. And then at 6 o'clock, we all go to our study groups, and the adults will be going to the sanctuary. So by the way, if you've been watching this uh, for the last several months, we will start back tonight in the sanctuary at six, and we are gonna be in the book of Acts. So I wanna encourage you to come if you possibly can and join us in the sanctuary tonight from six to six, six to 6.45. And so anyway, so it's the first Wednesday night in a very long time we're gonna have preschoolers being taught, children being taught, and youth being taught. And I, by no means, am expecting a massive crowd, but we are, I'm glad we're there. Uh, uh, we, we may have to change it up. We may have to delay another month down the road sometime because of the COVID cases, but I am, I'm really excited that we've at least taken this step. And also just for your information, remember on Sunday mornings, we now have Sunday school for every age group, Bible study from 915 to 1015. And of course we've changed our schedule. Worship will stay at 10.30, whereas, you know, a year and a half ago it was at 11. So Bible study at 9.15 to 10.15 and then uh, worship at 10.30. And, and if you can't come, many of you can't, and I understand that and your, your, your vulnerabilities to, to the COVID, uh, but you're watching and I'm so grateful. I've gotten a couple of texts today about people saying how grateful they are that we're able to do this uh, Facebook Live and they're able to watch Bible study and watch, just keep up with church life through through Facebook. So I uh, wanted to mention to you something else as you look. This is a, and I may have shown this before, but I have two things I plan for the church. Uh, one is on trafficking, children's being trafficked. I've got a couple of videos, so eventually we're going to watch on that. But the next one I want to do is a little bit more, I guess, a little bit more positive so to speak, but it's called Before the Wrath, and this is about an hour and 20 minutes, and since I've been preaching on uh, the book of Revelation and preaching on the return of Christ and the rapture, the tribulation, um, this movie is set, uh, it's set in the Middle East, anyway, it's, it's a movie about um, why there's a rapture, it, and what's so good about it is it doesn't deal with with when there's a rapture. You know, when is the rapture? And we all want to know. And that is important. But more important is why. Why has God, through Christ, promised that his church, his body, his bride, would not go through the wrath of God? Why? And, and of course, this answers that before the wrath. And, and of course, he's married, we're his bride. And, and so this is a video based on that. And it's a, kind of a slash movie documentary. And we're going to be showing this pretty soon. I'll let you know all the details. But anyway, so keep that. And I even have some extra copies of it down the road if you wanted to buy one. Also, I had mentioned to you um, about a website called America's Frontline Doctors. Um, and I encourage you, if you read a lot, on this COVID issues, this, these, I respect these doctors. They're, they're, they don't go with the flow, uh, but it's called America's Frontline Doctors. And I also mentioned that I use DuckDuckGo instead of Google because Google is politically correct and, and it, you have to fight through 30 different articles before you ever find America's Frontline Doctors. But anyway, I encourage you to read or listen, they had a they had a a video conference uh, at the Capitol uh, several months ago, with I think in October, 
and uh, they have a lot of good information about what, what masks can do and what masks cannot do. And so it's just some general information for you. I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about the Bible. But that is something I wanted, I wanted to mention to you. One other thing is in Time Magazine, somebody there wrote an article called The Secret History of, of the Shadow Campaign uh, that Saved the Election. In, in any way, I'm going to hold that up. It's through Time Magazine. This is a great article that, that it, it really, it didn't mean to, but it supports that the, the, that the election was stolen. Uh, they didn't mean to do that on this article, but anyway, it's a great article. Uh, time, and be honest with you, people take it down. You know, it was produced, and then all the Google and all these take it down, but it is a, a good article uh, about what happened at the election. Anyway, God's good. I'm going to read to you out of uh, out of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and uh, I just love what the Bible says. By the way, I broke my glasses. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm so blind without them. This morning, I got up. I must have knocked them off my nightstand. Uh, so I picked them up off the floor, didn't pay a bit of attention. And all morning, I walked around with them with one lens out and didn't realize it till I found my lens uh, when I was getting dressed to go to work. But anyway, so I'm, I'm going to have to be uh, very uh, conscientious about reading the scriptures uh, because I can't hardly see. But I'm reading out of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles and you want to turn there with me, because Paul makes some statements just about who we are in Christ um, and our responsibilities. He says it in the first couple of verses, uh, how God has called us, you know, in the first Corinthians chapter one. But uh, so it's first Corinthians chapter one, and I'll just read the first couple of verses. Then we're going to jump towards the end of the chapter. So with your Bibles, with first Corinthians chapter one, and while you're going there, I think the last time we talked, I had mentioned uh, Nehemiah and Ezra in the rebuilding of the wall. And I want to bring this back up because the, the, the history of, of them, you know, the, 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 the temple was torn down uh, when, when, when Jerusalem was run over by the Babylonians. And God allowed that in judgment because Israel failed to obey. And then they were, for 70 years, they went without a place to worship. Ezra and Nehemiah led the rebuilding of the temple and the walls. And, and Nehemiah, who's a cupbearer and, and kind of moved up politically in Persia, the Assyrian and, and Persian empires, gets permission to go back. And he leads the rebuilding of the walls around Jerusalem and around the temple. So, so they're rebuilding the walls. That's what he led them to do. And then you have, if you're reading the book of Nehemiah, you find they, I read it Sunday morning, part of it is they uh, read the scriptures, and uh, this is where we learn to stand when, when we read the scriptures, and Ezra was stood at a pulpit and read the scriptures, and when he opened the books, the people of God stood, so it's a great picture there, and they rebuilt the walls and fortified the gates, and then they worshiped the Lord after, and celebrated uh, what all they had accomplished. Well, Nehemiah leaves, so he goes and leads this, this uh, rebuilding project. And in 52 days, they got the job done. So he comes back to fulfill some of his responsibility to the Medes and the Persians. And he, he comes back, goes back to them, and he's gone for several years. And anyway, so he goes back to Jerusalem after a few years away. And what does he find? And this I just want you to mention because how how important it is that what we say the expectations, what does God expect of us? Nehemiah knew that God's will for the children of Israel was to obey God's word. And when he left, he found, and he came back, he found that many of them didn't obey. I'll tell you that in just a second. Well, the same is for us. God has a plan. What did he save us for? You know, we have to, we really have to think about that. Why did he save you? Uh, he saved you to conform you to the image of his son. And, and he's not waiting for you to die and to meet him before he starts that process. He starts that process at, a, at an event called the new birth. 
uh, we're born again, uh, a living hope where, where we go from being dead to alive and it changes us. And so I have to ask you today, you know, before we even read the scriptures, have you been changed? And, and so, so the, we, the prayer, you know, Jesus taught us how to pray. In Matthew 6, it says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So God's plan for saving a people is for us to obey him. And uh, I have to ask you, I mean, is that who you are? Is that who I am? Am, am? am I the person that's been transformed by the grace of Christ? And am I seeking to obey the Lord Jesus Christ? And Paul mentions several things about being saved. And I want to tell you that in just a second, but let's go back to Nehemiah. So Nehemiah leaves and go, the walls are rebuilt, the temple's dedicated, uh, great worship and all that. And then after a while, Nehemiah comes back to fulfill some responsibilities. So then he returns to Jerusalem. And this is what he finds. He finds, and I'm going to use M's so you can remember he goes back and he finds that they're, they've made a marketplace out of the temple. Uh, as a matter of fact, a couple of guys named Eliasib and Tobiah, they had, they had taken some of the storage areas of the temple area, you know, not the Holy of Holies and not the holy place, but the temple storage. They had taken that and they had made that as a storage for the wealth of Tobiah. So they began to market and to raise wealth. And especially on, on the Sabbath, on the day of worship, they, they planned to make money on the Sabbath day. And the, the wealth they were making were not going into the temple treasury. It was going into the treasury of Tobiah. Tobiah. You can read this in uh, Nehemiah 13. So, so, so uh, Nehemiah rebukes them for making God's house a place of marketplace, a place of business. And folks, I, I know maybe here at Redland, uh, that's not our nature, that's not our style, but I've been in churches. I, I've been in several First Baptist churches, and, and that's not, that doesn't make a First Baptist church bad. But in a lot of churches, a lot of First Baptist churches, it's where a lot of the, the town leaders come and all that. And, and sometimes church to some people becomes a place to market yourself, a place to develop business relationships, not about a place of humble sacrifice and servanthood and growing together and being the body of Christ. And so what happened was is after Nehemiah left, you had these people that rebelled and they saw the temple and the worship as a way to get money. So he rebuked them for making it a place to market. Number two, they neglected the ministries. There's something else that happened. When Nehemiah goes back to Jerusalem, not only does he find that there's these storehouses full of an individual's wealth rather than it being dedicated to the, to the temple, but he finds that the Levites and the singers are nowhere to be found. And when you study... The, the calling of the Levites and priests, there, there were supposed to be these, these groups of servants, Levites, and also you were supposed to have some of those Levites were singers. And in worship, they were to lead the music. And so you had servants and singers. Well, there was not any in the temple. There was nobody serving in those capacities. Even in the daily sacrifice, there wasn't people there to sing. There wasn't people there to worship. And he found out was they quit paying the staff. They quit paying the singers. And because the Levites and singers were supposed to get their pay from the offerings that came to the temple. But what was happening is they, this guy was taking those for himself, Tobiah was, rather than distributing the wealth among the singers and the Levites. And so the second thing that was wrong, when not only was he making a marketplace, they didn't take care of their ministers. And so the first thing that one of the first things Nehemiah did was rebuke them and he brings back the Levites and the singers for worship. It was about the worship of the Lord that, that uh, Nehemiah was worried about. Um, and the third thing that he found is that a lot of the Jewish believers, put that in quotes, 
that were obeying Jehovah, put that in quotes, had married pagan. They had let their children marry pagans. As a matter of fact, so many of them had married pagans that they were no longer speaking the native language of Hebrew. They were speaking the language of all these different pagan gods that were around them. Uh, and, this is, and this is what Nehemiah said to him. He says, Now you are bringing more wrath on Israel than ever before because of your disobedience. And so the three things they did to disobey is they made, they made the church a marketplace. They made the temple. They made the temple. Uh, they neglected the ministries. And they married outside of covenant people. And you find that to be true in the New Testament. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. We, we know that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6. So we're not, we're as believers, we're not supposed to marry unbelievers. And he says what in common, you know, has light and darkness. And so we have this, we're supposed to abstain too. So, so when Nehemiah goes back, he finds, he finds this disarray among God's people. And, and I think sometimes about us, I, I'm thinking that we've been consumed with COVID and our lives have changed. And my, my life at, in our home for the 11, 12 months has been so different. And, and so the warning for the, that Nehemiah gave of the children of Israel was about making God's house a marketplace, about forgetting the ministries, and about having relationships with pagans that worship false gods. Well, you know, there's things we may be struggling with. And, and God's calling us home. I mean, it's time for us to reassess where we are spiritually. Well, and then one other thing I want you to think about, and, and it's just fun facts to learn and enjoy from me, but uh, I was reading some Old Testament passages this week, and, and uh, uh, Diane's checking on me to see if I'm, not near, I'm through, and I'm not near through. But anyway, remember when David, King David, got the, God spoke to David, and, and David wrote down the dimensions of the temple. But because David was a, a military leader and a man of bloodshed, he couldn't build the temple. But God said to him, I have, I, and so David, and who does he give it to? He gives the dimensions of the temple to his son Solomon. And it says, I have in writing from the hand of the Lord the instructions for the temple. I have in writing from the instructions of the Lord the design of the temple. It's First Chronicles 28. Folks, that's for us. We're the temple of the living God. God's Spirit dwells in. And so His Word, we have His Word that tells us how we're supposed to live. Well, I, let me just read to you First Corinthians 1, and I want you to listen to what Paul says about saved people, about the church. He says, Paul, and he always did this in his introductions in these epistles. He introduced himself. He said, Call, Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. And that might possibly have been the man that was writing them. He was the scribe writing it as Paul dictated it. To the church of God that is in Corinth. And, of course, this is historically true. There was a church at Corinth, a wonderful church, big church. But we could also say in our world today, the church that is at Redland, the, the church that's in the Redland community, this is what the church does. I want you to listen to what he says. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to the church of God that is at Redland Baptist, to those, and it's describing us, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Now, I just want you to notice a couple of things about being saved. He said, to the church of God that is at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, the word sanctified means set apart, called to be saints isn't that interesting? Called to be saints together with all those who in every place that call upon the name of the Lord. Now, one of the things you find out from reading this is that this is why church life 
Every family's different. You know, our family, you come to our house, we have certain routines and that part's different. We all have different routines. Well, every church family develops its own personality, but there are basic things about every church that are true for every true church. People are sanctified. They're called to be saints, and they are called to obey uh, the law that's been laid down or, or the word of God that's been laid down by the Lord Jesus Christ. This, this is what Paul's emphasizing emphasizing to the church not only the church at Corinth but the church that goes everywhere now not only did Paul emphasize that all of us are called to be saints, sanctified in Christ Jesus but I do want you to notice what he says at the end of chapter 1 I'm just going to read these verses and then we'll close now he's talking about God saved us but he's going to tell us all that he's going to give us a little bit more details about being called to be saints this is in verse 24. He says, But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. And then he goes into the wisdom of God. So God's wisdom. But he says, For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. Then he says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were of were wise according to the stand to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose. And, and that's what he's saying is when, when you got saved, when God came and redeemed you, it wasn't because you and I were some famous athlete, not because we were some wise sage or we were some political leader, that's not why God saved us. And he's saying as God, God saved by his own divine plan, he just saved the common man. And so this is what he says, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. So the, when the world looks at me and you, when they look at the church, 1 Corinthians 1, 1 and 2, saved, sanctified in Christ Jesus Christ, how does the world view us? The world views us as foolish. This is what he says. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. So not only are we foolish, the world thinks we're fragile, we're weak. Uh, uh, God chose, you know, the world would not have picked us to be the leader. <coughs> so, so we're foolish, we're fragile, when the world looks at us, they think we're foolish, they think we're fragile. Look what he says. He says, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. So not only are we foolish, not only are we fragile, but the Bible says we're forgotten. The world looks at us and say, if they wouldn't be anybody in the world anyway, this is how the world looks at us. They say they would not be anything in the world anyway. So the world looks at us as if we're foolish, as if we're fragile, and if as if we're forgotten. Um, by the way, God calls people of the world ignorant, wicked, corrupt, and condemned. See, what Paul says is it's not about what the world says about saved people and the work of the church it's ultimately about what god says about saved people and the work of the church uh, when jesus was praying for me and you and all the saints in john 17 uh, he says something in john 17 i think it's around verse 20 21 through 25 he says through their obedience the world will know that you sent me. Now I want you to think about that responsibility. Because they will obey me, the world will know that you sent me. Now folks, here it is. The world's going to look at the church and they're going to think we're foolish. They're going to think we're fragile. They're going to think we're forgotten. We're just lowly. We're nobodies. Compared to this world, we're just absolutely nobodies. But through our obedience... 
the world's going to know that God sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So we're called in Christ Jesus, sanctified, and we're saints. We're set apart. Every one of us is a little vessel that God has saved and wants to use in His kingdom. Well, folks, I pray that you have a great the rest of the week, super week. If you're not able to be here tonight, I'll see you Friday morning at 9, and then hopefully if I don't see you before then, I'll see you on worship at 1030 on Sunday. God bless.